the Treater application. <laughs> we are thrilled to have so many of our students here who have literally won the lottery to be here. Uh, one of the most sought after seats here at the Forum and we warmly welcome all of you, members of the faculty and staff that are here. We're especially thrilled to welcome back a Harvard alumna, the current Attorney General of the State of Massachusetts, Maura Healy. General, welcome. Today, the students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School have had a very busy day here on campus, having breakfast at Annenberg, meeting with our faculty and IOP fellows, meeting with a great group of students committed to public service, uh, meeting with Boston public high school students and Cambridge public high school students in a, in a great session with President Drew Faust. So we warmly welcome all of you here to the forum tonight. Since the tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14th, our nation and the world has seen a significant focus on the issue of gun violence in school shootings thanks to the civic engagement of our guests tonight and their classmates. Last week, thousands of high school students across the nation walked out of classes in support of this effort. And at the Florida State Capitol last week, where Stoneman Douglas High School students had rallied, the governor signed legislation and signed a bill into law raising the minimum age to purchase a firearm to 21 and extending the waiting period for three days. And this weekend in Washington and in cities across the country, a march for our lives will be held. In the words of the organizers, to demand that their lives and safety become a priority and that we end gun violence and mass shootings in our schools today. And tonight, our guests will be in conversation with our moderator and with your questions to explore their journey and their efforts for this weekend's march. Or as Professor Marshall Gans observed to the Parkland students last night, how to turn this moment into a movement. And so this forum, the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics is the appropriate venue here at the Harvard Kennedy School to convene. For the IOP's mission is about two things, youth, and public service. And the students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, those here tonight and their classmates back in Florida, have lived through an unspeakable horror and are seeking ways to make a difference. They've spoken honestly about what they've witnessed and they've sought to use their voices to amplify those in other communities who endure violence every day without the spotlight. And what is heartening is that what we've seen in America's youth taking the lead in public debates to other important issues of our time, immigration, race relations, police youth relations, their energy and their commitment is breaking through where other generations have not succeeded. And it should be of no surprise that youth, like the rest of America, do not speak with a single voice. And here too, the IOP, is about a wide and diverse, full discussion of ideas. Another Stoneman Douglas High School student, Kyle Kirchhoff, has been actively supporting other legislative solutions. We've invited him to visit and discuss his perspective at a later date, and he's accepted our invitation and will let us know the date that works for him. But tonight, we turn to hashtag never again. In the efforts of tonight's guests, to turn this moment into a movement, to organize this weekend's march, and to galvanize public opinion. Many of you are frequent guests here at the Forum and know the protocols in which freedom of speech and civil discourse guide this Forum. And while we all understand that anyone in the audience may have a difference of opinion, we ask all guests at the Forum to respect our speaker's right to speak, as well as the audience members' rights to listen to our speakers. And a great hallmark of this forum is the important opportunity to ask speakers any questions during the Q&A session. 
And for those who can't respect these guidelines, we will ask you to leave the venue. But we've invited Megan Stone to be our moderator tonight. She's a former Shorenstein Fellow here at the Kennedy School and someone who is really uniquely poised to moderate tonight's conversation. She serves on the board of Indivisible and is the past president of the Malala Fund, who worked closely with another young leader who endured and suffered great tragedy and turned her efforts into movement making. So please join me in welcoming to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, our moderator, Megan Stone, and six students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Emma Gonzalez, age 18, a senior. David Hogg, age 18, a senior. Karen Kasky, age 18, a junior. Alex Wind, also a junior. Matt Deitch, who's a recent graduate of uh, Stoneman Douglas, and Ryan Deitch, age 18, a senior. Welcome to our guests. <laughs> conversation tonight by saying how special it is that you're here because it's only four days into the march in Washington DC and the sister marches all over the country so the fact that you're here with Harvard students with the faculty with the community here is really incredible and we're, we're honored that you made the time and the news this morning out of Maryland shows us yet again this conversation could not be more timely or more important or more needed and I know, Emma, when we were talking earlier today, you said how important it was to center the news today for tonight. So will you lead us in, in that? Um, I wanted to start tonight with a moment of silence, if that would be OK, because these tragedies don't seem to stop. And as much as we're trying to stop them, they do continue to occur. And it is important that we acknowledge them. And um, let's begin. Thank you. Thank you. Talking about silence and talking about speaking, you know, when we see what happened in Parkland, what happened in Maryland just this morning, there's always a lot of opinions about when is it time to speak and when is it time to stay silent. And you and your fellow student leaders decided to speak. And you've been speaking powerfully. It's only been five weeks. We've had hundreds of thousands of students walking out last week. We're looking towards Saturday and all the activity that's going to happen in DC and around the country. You know, for you, I want to ask, what is it that you're calling for with this voice that you're so powerfully using? What are you calling on leaders as you look to Saturday to do that you believe is going to stop what happened in Parkland and what happened in Maryland? And so I'd love, David, if you wanted to share about the policies that you're really fighting for today. Um, sure. So I, first off, I'd like to say I enjoy It's important that we have these moments of silence to remember these individuals, but I think is even more important um, and, and just as important is that we speak up. We've been silent for too long as a nation. We've allowed these things to continue for too long. And uh, continuing on with your question on Saturday, what's important is that we make sure that we speak up to these, uh, to these congressmen and these local and state legislators and let them know that these are what their constituents want and that if you choose not to vote on the side of students' lives, that's completely up to you. And if you choose not to vote on the side of just human lives that are, in, that are innocently taken, thousands of people every year, that's OK, because we'll vote you out. It's as simple as that. So one of the things that you know, this, this Center of Learning talks about a lot, and I think about Marshall Gantz and other leaders here at HCAS is about movements and how do they start, how do they emerge, how do they get power, how do they ultimately ideally achieve their goals and aims. And there's always a moment of decision, right? There's always this moment where maybe unlikely leaders step forward and decide that they have power and they're going to use their voice in a way that, that others haven't. So I want to ask Cameron, how did that happen? Can you bring us into the story of how you 
the students that are on the stage today, the many other students who are leaders in this movement who are so active, how did you come to that point of decision? How did that look like in the days following the attack? Of course. Um, while I was in the car on the way home after my father picked my little brother and I up after what happened on Valentine's Day, I was listening to the news mm -hmm. and I was looking at my phone and seeing what was going on and I started to realize, I've seen this before. I've seen this happen countless times. And what happens is we get two weeks in the news, we get a bundle of thoughts and prayers, everybody sends flowers, and then it's over. Mm -hmm. And then people forget. And I said, what's different this time? What can we do differently this time? I had thought about how, others, how other movements had not gotten the change that they needed. I realized we need to step forward now. We can't take that time. I can't take that time. The people with me did not take that time. We spoke out. We said, no, you're not controlling our narrative. You are not telling our story. We were there. We are telling our story. We see what's going on here. The entire United States, we see what's going on here. We see past this facade that this is inevitable and this is the price of our freedom. We know that we can fix this, but we have to jump now. We have to start now. So I instantly started writing. David instantly started writing and speaking. And soon enough, Emma gave her speech. Alex was speaking. We all got together and everybody we assembled on my living room floor and started small. But of the roughly 25 people that are in our direct group that coordinate everything and we work together, I don't know what we would do without a single person. Everybody has something that they're the best at. Everybody has something that, that makes them specifically important here. And the fact that we were all able together is almost, to, to get together is almost like a miracle because we all just found each other and we said, we are speaking out and we are strong, but together, they can't stop us, they can't silence us, and we can control what happens here and we can fix this. That's so powerful, especially as you think about the trauma that you were processing yourselves. And the one thing I can share from working for Malala is that uh, people tended to fast forward past the day she was shot and really focus on you know, the, the overcoming. And there's something redemptive in that, right? We all want to see someone who has been hurt overcome that harm and do something better and more powerful. But I think we have to take a moment and really acknowledge that this was, this was five weeks ago. And all of you had individual experiences with your friends, with your family members, people that you lost. You're still processing in real time your own trauma. And I think sometimes we can just move a little too quickly into celebrating what you've built which is incredible and meaningful, but right alongside of it, you're processing your own experience. How are you doing that every day? How are you taking care of yourselves? How are you balancing that as you've been thrust into the political spotlight while you're processing this trauma on your own? I don't know, Alex, if you wanna share. You know, what happened at our school, in the end, it's, you know, it's not different from what happened in Orlando and Las Vegas and Columbine and Sandy Hook and Aurora. They're all tragedies. The difference here is that we are the ones that were locked inside the closets texting our parents what could have been our final I love yous. We're the ones that were sitting there praying that when we heard knocks on our door and the glass shattered that it wasn't a shooter, that it was the police. We're the ones speaking out. And I think we're coping and we're healing through each other, which is so important because there have been times when, you know, one of us will just break down. And it's important to have everyone there with us. There was one day where we all decided to go back to the school and visit the memorial site and then go to the park and visit the memorial site. And it was so important and so impactful to see that, you know, this is why we're doing it. It's for the 17. And because it's not just for changing the future so this doesn't happen again. It's for honoring the past. It's for honoring those that lost their lives and the tragedies. And I think that's the best way to cope through this, to think, you know, we're doing this for them and we're doing this for a cause and we're doing this for people. It's 17 lives and it's hundreds of thousands of lives that have been lost before them and hopefully no more hundreds and thousands of lives after this. Yeah. Somebody else that wants to share about processing? I know Ryan, you had shared something that was really moving today about your family. Uh, just, I mean, with, with all of this, with 
everything that's been going on. I mean, Alex put it eloquently, we spent that day going to the memorials. I know that the most powerful imagery that I can say through this entire movement, everything that I, everything, all the traveling, everything we've been doing, speaking to the communities, the most powerful image I saw was looking at my high school, seeing flowers along the fences, seeing gravestones, little memorials set up, and then looking at it and only having it illuminated by a dimming candle and the blue and red lights of a police car. Seeing my high school, a place that I've been going to for now four years that I'm about to leave to see that. And that image was powerful. I just broke down and cried right there on the steps. And one thing that we have to constantly remember and Cameron brought it up, it was Valentine's Day. This was a day of love. This was a day of being together, of sharing with your family and your loved ones. And more importantly, it was our sister's birthday. And now that day cannot be that day of love. That day cannot be that day of family and sharing. It is a day of sadness. It is a day of grief. It's a day of remembrance. But what we're doing today, what we're continuing to do as we move on with this movement, as we move on with the march, as we move on through to the election and everything afterwards, we're doing this to make sure that that day doesn't have to be a day where all we do is cry. It is something that we will remember those we lost. We will remember everything that happened. But at the same time, it is a day that we want to make sure is not forgotten in history. I think as you've been sharing that grief, you've resisted the temptation to just look inward and instead to look outward and to see even beyond your own families, like who are, who are sisters and brothers in this fight with you. And I know. You know, Emma, you took a trip recently to Chicago to go stand in solidarity. And there was actually a 15-year-old student who spoke with you. I think her name was Rihanna Holman. And she said, what happened in Parkland is injustice. And injustice there is injustice here. And so what did you learn on that trip when you went to Chicago to, to shine a light of, and say that you were standing in solidarity with African-American and other communities that have been facing this for a very long time? Um, first, the Chicago kids came to visit us at my house, and that was a really good day. You know, we got to know each other, we got to settle that, we got to establish that, that foundation of friendship, and you know, it allowed them to get a sense of where we were coming from, just like, we're new to this, you know, like, we want you to help us through this so that we can help you through this, because we have a platform that we can get you on, you know? Um, and that day, um, that we visited Chicago, Alex King said, and I knew on a certain level, but to hear him say it was a whole nother thing. He told us the first day in his entire life that he had ever felt safe was those hours that he spent in Parkland. Because his community and their community is not as safe as ours. We were attacked in the most brutal way for one short day. We could never imagine the stuff that they go through on a daily basis for their entire lives. And it's time that we did try to imagine that. Because if we don't, then we can't get anything done ever. We have to empathize. We can't rely on the apathy that's been brewing in voter like we, voter apathy. We, we can't be that way anymore. We can't just delve into depression of like, I understand depression is a very serious mental illness and you should, um, a mental health problem that must be treated and stuff. I'm getting off topic, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You can't settle into that stew of thinking, I could never change anything. Mm -hmm. you, you need to act. Acting is incredibly important. And, and being with those kids, those students, who are practically adults, with what they've had to face at such a young age, too early in life, their, their innocence, they, it's almost as though they never had it. And that's not fair. Mm -hmm. Like, I, if I had, if I could give them anything and everything in the world I would. And we're trying with that. We're working with them in the future. We're gonna be working with them. Someone suggested take them to Harvard. And I was like, that's a wonderful idea. Let's get this party started, you know? Let, so like, we're gonna be branching out to as many places as possible. When we were there, there was a part of the Hispanic community that joined us in that church basement and they said, this is the first time that the Hispanic community and the African American community have mm -hmm. ever come together to talk about this topic, ever. And like, you know, as, as, as far as they knew. The, they, they shared information that was important. They shared conversations 
that had never happened before. They, they, they needed to get that information communicated, and they actually did. And now we know what to fight for, because we know the topics that everyone faces. And it was, it was incredible. It was so, so important. That's powerful. And it is important, because we find often when movements start to gain power that there's a narrative of division. And the fact that you're instead reaching out and countering that by being in solidarity is so vital and important. And I know, Brian, you'd shared too about meeting, I think, with a group of mothers in New York well, City. Uh, last week, my girlfriend and I were up in Massachusetts for a Jewish event. But as we were going home, we were given the opportunity to speak at a Park Avenue Christian Church. And it was a very small group of people, but they sang hymns, they did prayer. And it was very spiritual, very enlightening. But at the same time, there were these three mothers there representing from Harlem, talking about how they had lost their children due to gun violence. And now they have been together for roughly 11 years fighting this fight, and they've hardly scratched the surface. And we, and instead of showing anger, instead of showing spite, they looked me dead in the eyes and said, keep doing what you're doing. We want to help. And they said that they were doing voter registration up in Harlem, and I said, we're there. We want to be there. We want to join you. We want to make sure everybody gets the word out because we know we can't bring people back to life. We know we can't just dig up a grave, grab them, and go get steak and shake or something. We can't do that. But what we can do is we can make sure that no one else has to suffer through these preventable deaths. And I'd like to say that my brother also went through similar experiences in uh, Liberty City down in Florida. Mm -hmm. I know Matt, you've been doing a lot of work. Matt is the oldest member of the group, he's 20, and you're heading up, come on, grassroots organizing for the march. It's helpful to have a brother that's willing to take on that role, and of course, an, also an alumni um, of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, but what has been your focus in building that local leadership? You know, I know you've been doing incredible grassroots engagement work and really pushing ahead on this platform. What are you seeing leading up to Saturday? Uh, a lot of groups really attack this issue from many different angles, but none really look for the unifying force that we were. Uh, when they asked what about Chicago, Emma brought in Chicago, but you don't have to go to Chicago to see the pain of gun violence in lower socioeconomic places. We, I was invited to Liberty City to speak at a town hall in Liberty Square, which was, I'm 100% sure that our leaders don't know that place exists. I mean, that was one of the most powerful rooms I've ever been in. I was, there was about 200 kids and they asked the question, who here has survived gun violence and, or has lost someone due to gun violence? And every single hand went up. The seven-year-old next to me held his hand up like it was nothing, like he just answers that question every day of his life. And these guys, these kids, they're survivors. And they know more about this issue than than us, but their trauma is the same as all my friends up here. I mean, we all bleed the same blood and we have to come together to fight this on a unified front. And it absolutely, it makes me actually sick that we made these connections after we were invited to Harvard because I wish for nothing more than to share this stage with them because it's so important for their voices to be heard. I just, if, if we can't create a unified front to fight for people, for human lives, that's where the change is going to be. We need that in order to actually make progress, not just for Parkland or Chicago or Liberty City, but every place in America needs to come together and stand up for this and make this the voting issue so that we can draw the line in the sand between the leaders that are the leaders who are there for them and for their position and for profit and the people who are actually fighting for people's lives and to save us. That's powerful and, you know, as you've been calling for this change, this action. Some people have said, how is it that students are standing up and doing this? And it seems as if they've forgotten that there's actually a long history of students <laughs> leading social change and leading movements. And uh, two weeks ago, I was in Selma with Congressman John Lewis, and we were visiting civil rights sites and hearing from foot soldiers of that movement and leaders in that movement. And every single event you were discussed, every single event you came up as feeling that you're carrying a torch forward. And I would love to, to read you something that John Lewis said. They asked him at one of the panels and discussions, what would you say to parents who are concerned about their children walking out or taking action? And he got very calm. He just said, I would tell those parents not to be worried. It just means that their children have been touched by the spirit of history. 
what is what does that mean to you? And you know, your your parents actually are here. Can I ask your parents and your grandparents to stand for here? We have parents and grandparents of these students. I really want to honor you. And I also want to honor Jacqueline, who's another one of the student leaders and organizers who's here. If you want to stand, Jacqueline, we're grateful for all of your mom. Yeah, Jackie. <laughs> it's really amazing to see how all of you work together. It's really something to behold. You know, I want to read you um, one other thing that John Lewis said as he was standing on Pettus Bridge in Selma. He says, I want to say to the young people and the young leaders, just give it all you've got. Do not get weary. Be hopeful, be optimistic, take the long, hard look. We had some difficulties in the civil rights movement. They will have some difficulties. They will have some setbacks, but you can't give up and you cannot give in. And so that was his encouragement to you. You know, as you look to history for examples, because we're, we're really focused at HKS about learning from those that went before, right? And using what works and, and learning from what didn't. What have you been seeing from looking at the civil rights movement that you feel like you're taking into your work today? What's been powerful? Uh, well, I mean, one of the most powerful things was uh, a little while ago we were invited to Capitol Hill to meet with hundreds of representatives and sen senators and congressmen from around the country. And it was just a powerful experience to meet with both sides of the aisle to talk about an issue that is very near and dear to us. And just one of the most powerful meetings that we had that entire day was with Congressman John Lewis. And just to think that this man, who'd worked his entire life for, so, for civil rights, to be able to just have the right to vote, is now a congressman in this country, that is just commendable in its own right. But for him to continue to fight, for him to continue to fight for what's right in his community and communities around the world, is just so, it just makes me feel, feel so hopeful for the future with a man like this. Like, we're always taught that the civil rights movement is something that happened in the past, and it's something that is past and that change doesn't really happen in today's society. But that's not true. That we, we can see change every day if we just put ourselves to it. That someone like John Lewis, he organized the March on Selma, and he was the first man beaten on Bloody Sunday, and he still got up and he still continued to march, and he kept at it, he kept going until they reached the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about us, like, versus even just a movement like the Civil Rights Movement, that, that movement is about, it, it lasted decades. It was a long and a hard fight. And just for us, this has been five weeks. And the amount of change that we have seen, the amount of hope that we have seen in the eyes of the American people, it makes us want to keep going every day after day. And just for the meeting with John Lewis itself, when we walked into that office, every other congressman, every other senator, they made us sit down in a boardroom, they made us sit down at the table, they made us wait a few minutes, they made us late to other meetings because they made us wait. And, but for when we walked into John Lewis's office, first off, he had amazing artwork everywhere, he had Coca-Cola products. Uh, <laughs> But beyond that, the first person I saw when we walked in that door, it was him. He shook my hand. He was the first person to greet me in his own office, and that's how it should be. That is a civil servant, and that is somebody who is there for the interests of the people. And that was just the best experience that we could have. It shouldn't be, it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a surprising feeling. It, you shouldn't be surprised to see a congressman in his own office. But... <laughs> But John, yes. and, and definitely his, his line that he says, good trouble. It's that you have to bend some rules, you have to go around the mm -hmm. systems in place to make sure that in reality that everything is fair, everything is just, because the universe is on the side of justice. Martin Luther King preached that. Principle and number six. <laughs> what? Principle number six. Princ principle number six. But uh, just that very idea, that very ideal that we should follow, that John Lewis really represented, and he is a living legend, and we are grateful that he wanted to meet with us. We're grateful that he even continues to mention us after that one meeting. Like, we didn't all meet with him. It was only a select group of us there. But for him to be so moved by us is just moving in its own right. Yeah. What, what does good trouble mean to you as you look towards the march on Saturday, Cameron? Well, first of all, it's easy with everything that's happened to completely lose, to, to be disheartened by the current state of Congress. But it's men like John Lewis, 
he doesn't owe the United States of America anything. He has done more than his job to protect the people and to stand for those who need it. And here he is fighting every single day for us. It's men like that that make me say we have a bright future. People aren't always corrupted. They're still good in this world. They're still good in the offices. Not a lot of it anymore. But our generation can stand up and not be ruined like many because he is still here fighting for us after the United States put him, was tailored against him. He was born into a world that was trying to slow him down, and he kept fighting, and here he is still fighting for us. That's one of the things that makes us so hopeful when we look into the future. It's, it's patriotism that costs something, continues <laughs> to cost something. It's powerful. You, know, you talk about uh, 2018 members of Congress. I know this has become something that you are really laser focused on. Every time I've seen you speak, you're talking about voter registration. You're talking about getting ready to register before you even turn 18. You're talking about really getting active as you look towards the next year. What does that mean for you? How do you want to hold elected leaders accountable? You know, I think some of the, the breakthrough moments of your town hall with CNN was just insisting. Um, I, I saw a tweet that was like, you should teach a class called follow-up questions and <laughs> instruct lawyers in how, how to learn from you about how to do it. How, how do you plan to hold elected leaders accountable? Because you're unapologetic about making this an election issue, unapologetic. So how do you focus on doing that as you shift past the march, looking into the months to come? Yeah, you know, about us being teenagers, you were saying earlier, I don't think this movement would be possible if we weren't teenagers. Because we've seen it done before when the Sandy Hook, when Sandy Hook happened, the parents came out and started speaking. They weren't able to get the job done, and they still work to this day. However, we were the ones there. We know what it's like, and we are making real change. We are making change happen in this country. We were the only people that are able to do it because we are the only ones able to reach out to the youth and connect with the youth and connect with the 18-year-olds, the, the, the new voters, the 25-year-olds, the new voters, and show that it's our time to make change in this country. What we need to do is that we need to ask every politician to make a central and public stance on this issue so in November, our job as voters is that much easier. Because in the end of it, it's not about Democrat or Republican. It's about children's lives or children's deaths. And we need to make sure that we are all voting for children's lives. Because no child, no person should be afraid of texting their parents a final I love you. Or no child should be afraid of going to a concert and being afraid of getting shot, or going to the mall, or going to the airport to visit a family friend and get shot in an airport. No person should be afraid to walk outside of their house and get shot in Chicago, or in Baltimore, or in Boston. It's just not the way I want to live in this country, and it's not the way that we should live in this country. So it's absolutely huge that we vote in this next upcoming election. We deserve better. We're not going to settle for less. Exactly. And on the topic of kind of what we learned about the civil rights, um, like what we're taking from that, I, I think what's important to realize here is it's hate and it's fear and it's anger at both sides of the political spectrum that got us to this point, and it's not what's going to solve this. What's going to solve this is the same thing that helped promote the civil rights movement. It's love and compassion for both sides and seeing each other not as Democrats or Republicans, but as Americans, for God's sake, because that's really what Fear and anger is what's got us here. What we have to do now is, now that we've used that fear and anger as motivation, initially get us started, which has exhausted us emotionally, we can use love and compassion to emotionally empower us and continue this fight for good and justice. Because the universe, I do believe, the universe is on the side of justice, and justice will prevail. But it can't if people don't get out and take action and show each other that they love each other as Americans. Because at the end of the day, we all bleed the same blood. We've all been kids. And right now, our future's dying as a result because we forgot to learn, we've forgotten to love each other. And that's really what is going to solve this. Yeah. Powerful. <laughs> OK, we're going to get ready to go to questions in a minute. So if you have a question, we're going to try to have as much time as possible to really engage with each other. This is a community moment. So if you want to ask a question, this is a good time to get up and start getting in pole position at a microphone. Um, so this is your warning. So before we go to the rest of the room, you know, you've said that this is not a red or blue issue, this isn't partisan, but you've been tried, people have tried to peg you as partisan. Do you firmly reject that? Do you firmly reject that in all that you're doing as you look towards Saturday? Well, you obviously, there's a clear correlation between the party and the politicians taking money from the NRA. Now there are politicians in both parties accepting money from the NRA. 
and these lobbyists can't own our politicians. Sure, they own more Republicans than Democrats, but we're not letting Democrats who are funded by the NRA off the hook. Right now, at this very moment, we are talking about gun safety and gun legislation. So anyone on any side who is not stepping in the right direction on that, that that's who we're here to stand up against. That's who we're here to say, you work for us, you need to represent us, we put you in office and we will easily take you out. Another reason of office. So <laughs> another reason why this is so important to be completely bipartisan about this is because bullets don't discriminate either. Why should yeah. we? If, if a bullet can catch you no matter who you are, what color skin you have, what gender you are, what position you play in life, how old you are, then why should we discriminate against who should be protected? I, I mean, just with all of this, just looking at the history of this country and everything, like it, bullets do not discriminate. This it, this form is named John F. Kennedy Form. He was shot. He was killed by a gun, and his brother too was also killed by a gun. And there are countless others. There's even Steve Scalise in ca in Congress right now who was shot. Whether or not he believes in the things that we believe is his own point, but he, the bullet does not discriminate. It doesn't matter what party you're in, it will still come for you when the time comes. Powerful words. All right, we're gonna go to questions from the audience, and we just wanna give some gentle reminders. Um, number one, identify yourself. You're part of a community, we wanna know who you are, um, so please tell us who you are. And then we want you to ask questions and be brief and have a real question, not a statement. Do not give the State of the Union up in here. We will cut you off and go to someone else. You've been warned. All right, so I, I would love to start over here. Please tell us who you are and what your question is. Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Joan Moon. I'm a first year master public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, I'm also a former educator. And what I want to ask from you guys is, what is your call for action to teachers? What do you want to see teachers doing the teachers' unions, um, if you have an opinion on arming teachers, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank well, you. First of all, I, I'm not going to, uh, I'm sure there's somebody here who could speak better about arming teachers and how we all know that that's ridiculous. But in regards to a call to action to teachers, inspire your students to vote, to speak out, to educate them on who they're voting for, how to search up what these, what these elected officials are representing. Let them know not to just look at the party, but to look at the policy. No matter what party they fall under, whether or not it's yours, don't let your party affiliation be known. I have some teachers who really let their party affiliation be known, and that's not their job. Their job isn't to tell us what they believe about politics. Their job is to inspire us to learn more, to educate others, and to start a conversation. Because at the end of the day, it's a conversation, not a debate. Also, thank you for educating. Uh, uh, really important thing to add with that is, you know, sponsor an advocacy club or a politics club or try to get a class in state, like a, pe a period of the day where you can just talk like education of politics or like the judicial system, which a lot of kids in our school can't learn about unless you're um, in 12th grade and a lot of kids don't even end up paying attention or trying to skip out on that class because it's boring. Make it exciting. Make it... Like some, it's some some, it's something you need to know. Classes. Yeah, some schools don't have civics classes and that's... Did you have civics? I mean, a lot of people have commented about how powerful you are, the follow-up questions, your ability to speak, your ability to stay on message. Like, how does your education... Are there specific teachers that you feel like prepared you for this? Definitely. You were very unlikely, but yet likely through everything you learned. Percent. There are several teachers that have prepared us for this, but at least for this year, everyone in the senior class, uh, Jeff Foster, the AP government teacher, he, he is one of the most amazing and most inspiring men. He is able to, if he was on this forum, he would finish every single question in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yes, he yes. so quickly. He can speak out everything. He can get out the entire platform that we have presented today just like that. Like, he is just so inspirational. He's been helping organize, making sure that the political process is followed through. Whether or not he believes everything we have, he supports the students, and he has really built us up. I mean, I'm in a class with Emma. I'm in that class with Emma. And that day, like she said at the first rally on Saturday where she gave her famous speech, uh, she had her government notes. We learned about the NRA that day. That day, that we learned day, about the NRA. February the day of the 14th. Shooting. We learned about the NRA and how they are a very powerful lobbying group, and now we're going head-to-head -head with them? <laughs> like, 
Je Jeff Foster has definitely prepared us for. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you did you, did you, did you share your speech remarks with any of your teachers before? Because I have to say, like working on campaigns, when you started leading the call and response about what we call BS, any political staffer would have been like, take out the BS line. Right, but that's what made it go viral. It was actually authentic, it was real, it cut through. Like, I, I didn't share it with anybody. I had written it in two and a half hours, which is one of the reasons why I've been so good at speaking about this is because I had creative writing classes for like four years. David was in debate. These kids were in drama and TV production. The arts, fund the arts, please. But um, to answer your question about army teachers, I think David had something to say here. Do we want, I think the simple question for people to ask themselves about whether or not we should arm teachers is, do we want to turn our schools into war zones? No. <laughs> teachers have already fired guns yeah. in classrooms since that was proposed, and that's why you haven't been hearing about it a lot, because it's happened. And on the, on the note of what teachers can do, I would say, rather than just teaching a subject, it, for example, if you're teaching Algebra 2, don't just be like, this is a quadratic graph. Like, no. Show them real-world implications. Show them how this has real implications in engineering, like aerospace engineering, how you can create flying cars through advancements in science, engineering, technology, and math, and advance the, not only American economy, but the inspiration of those children, too. Not to mention the arts, which are also just, just as important, because without my debate class, without Jesus Carl, my debate teacher, I wouldn't be here speaking. In fact, two, two years before this, I was at Harvard on Valentine's Day, at a speech and debate tournament. And I think it's really through funding those special programs that has enabled me and so many other students to be able to speak up against this. But at the end of the day, if you want to leave with one thing, it's just, if you're a teacher that's out there listening, or uh, as a teacher, I would say just make sure there's real world implications. If you're teaching Gov, show them how this is not just something that you need to memorize because you're going to get a grade for it. Make sure there's intrinsic value in that because people work a lot harder when they realize the actual value of something rather than them just working towards it as a grade. Show them the real world implications and we'll change the world. Yeah, I think you just won the heart of debate coaches everywhere. <laughs> All right, let's, let's go over here. What's your, who are you and what's your question? Uh, hi, my name is Colin Killick. I'm also an MPP student here and chair of our Disability Justice Caucus. Um, I wanted to thank you first for not stigmatizing people with mental health diagnoses the way so many have, and to ask how you think we should be talking about mental health in American high schools. What's really important is that um, what mental health and gun violence do not coincide. It's not like people who have met bad mental health shoot up schools all the time. That's not true at all. It's when they get together that it's bad, and then the NRA uses it as an excuse, and then they try to make, they try to use it as a selling point. Like, oh, this is a dangerous person. They might be in your community. Maybe you should have an AR-15 to take them out. No, that's not, that's not how we should be living. What's really important is like, you know, those, those, um, that hashtag before that was arm the, arm the teachers with pencils, color pencils, tissues, paper. Arm the schools with therapists, actual therapists, not guidance counselors who will baker at <laughs> suicidal students. Actually invest in health care. Health care! Do that! Yes, and and um, another thing that's very important right now in the narrative of everything and, and the way everything, this whole story is being told is to stop using the word crazy. Because you'll see at the CNN Town Hall, the NRA thing I had to talk to, she kept using the word crazy. You can't measure crazy. There's no number for crazy. There's no scientific definition of crazy. They are try like Emma said, they are trying to paint the image that people with mental health problems shoot up schools. Well, the set shooter at, I believe it was Sandy Hook, Sandy Hook, his father is the vice president, still is, of General Election, Electric. He had a platinum health care plan. It was seeing two different mental health professionals and then shot up a school. You, some people are simply malicious. You cannot see somebody and identify that that person is dangerous. My little brother has autism and people will often treat him as somebody with a disability. Well, it's pe people with mental, developmental disabilities, with mental health problems, mm -hmm. they are people and they need to be treated like people and they need to, to be treated like citizens who deserve respect. And they can't just be thrown in and lumped in with everybody who wants to shoot up a school, a church, a movie theater, or anything else. Yeah, yeah I know that, that your father has actually done a lot of work about trying to educate how to handle crisis situations with, with any children that have special needs or might be in a classroom or school situation and done a lot of really powerful work on yeah. that. So we celebrate yeah. that and we honor that too. And on that topic, uh, 
at, at my school, when I, like, for example, when I first went to Stoneman Douglas, I was, because of my IP and my dyslexia and ADD and my ADHD, um, they told me that I couldn't take any AP or honors classes. They told me that I would not be successful in those classes because of my disabilities. And what I said to that was absolutely not, and I, I, I took them. And I, I had to fight for that, but I'm, I'm sure as hell glad I did, because I would not be here today speaking if it wasn't for those advanced placement classes and me challenging myself through those. But I, in the same way that people try kind of grouping people like me with learning disabilities, like, oh, you have an IEP, like, you can't, like, do anything. I, I think that we need to realize that if we, we can't stigmatize anybody with a learning disability, we can't stigmatize anybody with a mental health issue because that is not how we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this by learning to love each other and speaking to each other. And if you're not welcome in the NRA, you're welcome with us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. All right, we're going to go up here. I see you just wear a bad ombre shirt to the event tonight. So um, we're excited to hear your questions. Yeah, so uh, my name is Nathan Goldberg. I'm a senior here at the college and a brand new American citizen. Um, so, um, did you register to vote? Yes. So I processed my citizenship just so that I could vote in November. Um, and I, I understand how important it is to have a vote, but do you ever feel the sense that you need to go one step further and just run for office and do it yourselves? Oh, that's a good question. The important thing to remember with us is that we are students. We're trying our very hardest. And like, some of us are gonna go to college next year, some of us are gonna do whatever we gotta do. Wait, 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 we're at Harvard, we're at Harvard. You're not, who's not going to college next year? I'm a junior. We're yeah, junior. We're <laughs> That's what you meant, but we are most definitely not going to. <laughs> no, but, but some of you have been thinking about not, not going, like deferring for a year, right? To pursue yeah. the movement? Uh, I'll, I just want to answer his question. <laughs> yeah, we can just like, deferring to answer here. Their parents are here. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have, ask, have been asking us about our political aspirations, and I think it's just because they're surprised to see people intelligent on the issues that have good intentions for people. And I think that is something that shouldn't be rare in this society. I believe that there are good people out there that we can find and get them to run for office for both parties. I, I, I mean, it's important that young, young people run for office. If you're 18 years old, run for your school board. Be out there, represent the people in our generation because we have each other's best interests in mind. Just, just like with, with all of this, like, I mean, especially, they, they like to denounce America's youth. They, they like to say that we eat Tide Pods and that we only spend time on our phones. And like, you, you laugh and things, but this is serious arguments for people who don't want to support the things that we are fighting for. And at the same time, you gotta think back, like, I mean, I was looking into this today on our founding fathers. And James Monroe, during the signing of the Declaration of Independence, was 18 years old. He became a president of the United States. He's a founding father and has statues all over this country. He is a patriot, and he was 18 years old. No one accused James Monroe of eating a goddamn Tide Pod. <laughs> Aaron Burr was 20 like Matt, and Aaron Burr turned out, well. <laughs> so I, I think that my response to that is, I think some of us eventually will try running for office possibly, but what, what's more important to realize is we can change our, our country, but what's really, what the real challenge here is ensuring that power does not corrupt, because no matter how good you are, no matter how good I am, the, the greed and corruption that's always there in politics because people get lax and they blindly trust their leaders is something that can and always will happen, but it's our job as a democracy to get out there and make sure that these politicians don't become corrupt because when you don't pay attention to what's going on, you're absolutely complicit in the death of our democracy. We are Never quiet the and Never stop asking them questions, no matter what, even if it's your favorite elected official. Every time they do something, look into it. Don't let them off the hook. Even the best civil servants could do something that is not good for the people. You know, 97% of people in this country believe in expansive and universal background checks. And if you account in margin of error, basically 100% of people believe in <laughs> universal and expansive background checks. Yet, nobody in the government has done anything to do that. There's been a lot of talk about it, yet no action. Why is that? Politicians, politicians are supposed to be working for the people, yet they're not doing what we would like to do as people. So what we need to do is that we need to show the politicians that you know, a lot of them have the stigma that 
they haven't been doing anything and they keep getting reelected. So they think, I'm going to keep doing nothing and then keep getting reelected because they're afraid to do something and upset their constituents. Well, now, if they don't do anything, they're going to learn that they're upsetting their constituents. Okay. All right. I just want to bring up Maine. Like, cap this question off because we've been talking for too long. Um, if we were politicians, we wouldn't be able to say half the stuff that we can say now, and that would be sad. Uh, I just want to talk about that we can get a lot more out of this country by inspiring better people to run for office, and we've already seen that at small scale when someone attacked Emma Gonzalez for being a quote unquote skinhead lesbian. Skinheads uh, are bad, lesbians are good. <laughs> just want to make sure we say that. I can talk to that. We, David, and we, it was on Twitter that this person was terrible and was running unopposed, and they spoke out about her a few hours before the filing deadline, and David tweeted saying, please, anyone, I don't care what party you are, just be a better person than this person. <laughs> and a 28-year-old woman, uh, what was her name? Erin? A R A R Y A. Erin Gilchrist, I think. The letters and it I want to give her a shout out. But she, she said, I had never intended to run for public office, but now I had no choice. And I want better people to feel that way because we have to take on this system from the ground up. And then she dropped out of the election. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Twitter. Thank, Thank you for your question. Thank you, David. David really Thank you. All right, I want to go over here. Please tell us about you and your question. Hi, I'm Jameson Reed. I'm a freshman of the college. Um, first of all, I very desperately hope that your movement succeeds, which is why I'm in the awkward situation of giving you this particular proposition. Um, so I think a lot of the dialogue has been on the NRA side, for example. These kids are eating Tide Pods or whatever. But also on... Uh, the other side, it's like they have blood money or they bought out politicians and they're like this kind of oligarchic, I don't know, they're corrupting the democracy, but would you consider perhaps that it might be advantageous for school safety and gun violence in general to actually work with people and politicians who support not necessarily the NRA as an organization, but at least the message of the NRA? because. I, I mean, like, for example, our generation, at least according to NPR, still has the same views on gun violence, or sorry, gun, gun laws as previous generations. So I think if we avoided attacking people who, or politicians who take money from the NRA and actually actively worked with them, we might have a better shot. Because, yeah. I mean, we can't ban guns. It's America. It's not going to work. And we can't do nothing. So if we came across the aisle and got together, I mean, it'd be great. Uh, yeah. So let's give that to the panel. David's got to do it. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I'm really glad you brought that up. I want to cover a few things. One, we are not trying to take your guns. And two, we are not going against law-abiding gun owners that are reasonable and are joining the NRA because they want to become safe, responsible gun owners and become politically active. I think that's something that, regardless of uh, who you are, so it, like, we can all support more political activity regardless of which side of the aisle you're on. When I've been saying these things, um, for speaking on my behalf, it's been to the, to the officials in the NRA that are literally calling us out and uh, essentially threatening us. Um, I am not going against law-abiding gun owners. My, we have guns in my house. Cameron has guns in his house. My dad's a retired FBI agent. His dad's a part, part Reserve general. police officer. So we, we understand both sides of the argument. Where we want to draw the line, though, is I don't think that you need a weapon of mass destruction, and I especially don't think that somebody with a criminal history or somebody that is uh, mentally unstable should be able to get one of these weapons. And I think that's something that we can cross the aisle on. But I think if we don't point out who these politicians are that have not allowed, for example, something that has widespread support, even amongst NRA members, is more CDC research. And the NRA lobbied to make it so that the, one of the biggest government organizations, the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control, can't research something that kills over 13,000 people a year or 96 people a day or one every 15 minutes. And I think that's where we need to draw the line. Was the, I think the NRA was a good, generate, a, a, a good organization that did teach gun safety, but now that they're working on behalf of the gun lobby, I think what they're trying to do to the American public is wrong because they're trying to scare us 
and create this cycle where they scare more people, sell more guns, allow the slaughter of more innocent Americans, and sell more guns as a result. And that's where I draw the line. And I'd like to quickly add that we are not, again, t trying to steal, take everybody's guns away. The guns in my house are responsibly managed. I don't know where they are because I shouldn't. I have, not been I have not been trained for the use of firearms the way my father was when he was in Miami Shores. But we are simply trying to get rid of the guns that can shoot off 50 rounds in a split second. That's, wh that's what that is, because these are weapons of war that soldiers are trained to use. Soldiers are trained to use them. And when I turn 18, there are several places where I could just buy one and walk out of the store with it. The fact that gun purchases are not digitized that is, is ridiculous. Matt, you get something to say about that? Yeah, I just wanted to say it like this. There's 300 million products out there that are unregulated and killing someone every 15 minutes, and our politicians don't choose to not talk about it, not even mention it in bills. When that happened with Tide Pods, they addressed it in less than a week. They locked them up it, in Target. You had to have a, like a store person bring a key to the Tide Pods. So when you mention it like that, when we're talking about that this is a product that no one knows, anyone can get it, and it's killing people every day at a very high rate, at a higher rate than anywhere else in the world, in a developed nation, we have to really look at how can we put precautions in for public safety, not just in schools, not just in concert, but public safety, to really ensure that the right people are the ones getting guns, and we're not just giving a gun to anyone who wants one, because there's a ton of bad people out there getting them. I have a question to follow up, I think, in the spirit of your question, is that just on messaging, right? So like, this is an important piece of strategy for any movement. How are you going to communicate around the issues you're talking about? And when you find that you're getting messaging from the NRA or from online that is hostile or that you feel like is a personal attack, ha have you talked amongst yourselves about how you're going to respond? How you, you know, if they go low, we go high. You know, how, how have you been framing how you're well, going to respond? Well, one thing, you know, David pointed out that some of these videos are threats. And I'm going to quote, um, Jamie Guttenberg's father, Fred Guttenberg, and about in regards to the video of Dana Loesch with the hourglass, in which she said to people, your time is up. We're running out. That is something, if a terrorist organization had sent that video out to the United States, everyone would be on high alert. Because by someone flipping over an hourglass and saying your time is running out, that's a threat to America. And that's a threat to the American people. And that should not be people, politicians should not be taking money from a group that says to their constituents, your time is up. And to us, we don't want to really be associating with people that are threatening the American citizens. There's a handful of individuals who oppose us. They know that they can't oppose our message, so they start attacking us personally. And if anything, that just speaks for us even further. That shows that when people will send us these things, when they'll release these propaganda videos to slow us down, that should, they don't, they're just trying to attack a bunch of survivors of a school shooting. Well, I mean, like, especially, one, one thing that society has tried to push onto people is like, oh, just shut out the haters. Like, don't care what they have to say. But at the same time, like, whether or not they're a real person is besides the point. What really matters is there's someone out there who opposes your view. So when it comes down to it, you have, in some way, shape, or form, you have to respond to that. You have to respect that other people have different opinions, and you have to respond like fairly to those. I try to respond as eloquently, as intelligent as I can, to elevate the conversation, to be able to actually have one, instead of, like, for so many years, for so much of this debate, for so, for so much of this fight, people like to throw chairs at each other instead of sit down at that table. And one, one instance that I'll say is that uh, somebody contacted me after the CNN town hall. They said, great job on CNN. So I just opened it up because I'm going through my messages and then I was gonna respond. The next line says, how much do you get paid? And getting rid of the fact that they think that crisis actor is a real job in this country, which uh, Donald Trump Jr. No, thinks so. But, like, when it comes down to it, I, I responded and I felt like I responded like a politician because I said, I did not get paid in money, I got paid in the faith and admiration of my fellow classmates and my fellow Americans. But then, then I said to that, you asked for a number. So I gave him my personal cell phone number 
And then the response to that was, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I never got a call. I was never confronted again. That number has never been misused. And I've given it out to several people who have attacked me. And the fact is that once you get rid of that wall, once you get rid of the fact that it's just online and you bring it into reality, they don't want to attack a child. They don't want to attack children. Because they realize like what we're doing has some truth to it. And when they realize it, it kind of scares them. Like you can disagree with an assault weapons ban. You can disagree with numbers and facts that we give. But at the end of the day, people are dying. And we're trying to stop that. And if you're against that, that's inhuman. And for all those reasons and the, all of the above, that's why I think it's important that we put the USA over the NRA. Let's <laughs> right, right. go right. so back to the floor. I, I see you, a young leader at the microphone. We really want to hear about your question and who you are. Okay. Hello, I'm Noah King. I'm nine years old, and I want to know if any of you guys um, know like another shooting at your school. Can you say that again? Can you share a little more about your question? It's a really good start. Do you want to share a little more about your thought? Um, I just wanted to know if any of you guys have heard of another school shooting at your school. At Stomadoga specifically? Yeah. Like, are they afraid that there might be another shooting? Or has there been one, or has, has there been one since? Been one? No. I don't believe so. Yeah. There's only been the one. But I mean, there have been instances, like I did speak of this at the CNN Town Hall uh, during my fifth grade year, a bunch of my entire class had to get into a bathroom because there was a code red in the area. There was no shooter present, but there was a shooter in the, in the area, in the town, just driving through. And because he wasn't apprehended, they had us hide in the, in the bathroom. But in the case of Stoneman Douglas, no. That being said, we've had to prepare. And that's one of the worst things is that students everywhere have to do code red drills. They have to be ready. They have to be fearful when they're in school that somebody's going to come down with the weapon that was used against us and gun them down. We've had conversations in class. We've taken class time to discuss this. All of our teachers have shown us where in the classroom we are going to hide. And to be honest with you, if Stone Douglas didn't prepare the way they did, if we didn't have our faculty and our leadership, there's a chance that this tragedy could have been a lot worse. So I'm eternally grateful for faculty members like Aaron Feiss and the rest of the leadership at the school, Scott Eagle, Coach Hicks, the, so many of the people we lost at Stoneman Douglas, we lost as they were trying to help others. And that's because they were prepared for this. So as awful as it is that these code red, that, that these drills have to happen, for now, until we fix this, they, have, they saved lives. And I, I don't know if you know anything about like during World War II and like the Cold War how. Uh, but <laughs> Wait, dude, before you before you ask that, he's nine. He's nine. He probably can does. I just follow a question? What brought you here today? Yeah, my mom. <laughs> Shake, oh, you shake their hands. Mm -hmm. Give them some high fives. Okay, okay, We're glad you're here. What great are you? You inspire. I love your dinosaur shirt. That is a amazing <laughs> direction. All right. You know, it takes a lot of bravery to come do that. Thank you for coming tonight. We're glad you're here. Good job. All right. It's hard um, to go after the case. Kid, any of you but you're the, the next future. questioner. <laughs> really quick. Um, no. Dave, oh, yeah. Just let me just, no. just quickly. I think the one other time in U.S. history where we've had an instance where thousands and millions of school children have had to worry for their lives in school was during the Cold War with air raid drills and not knowing whether or not we we're going to be doomed. But you know what we did is we took action. And through that, we've ensured the safety of Western and Eastern ideals. And as such, we've learned to learn to accept each other. And I think that's what we have to do as Americans. We, we can't be in a war anymore. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir? Let's go to this question right here. Um, hi, thank you all so much for your bravery and your activism. My name's Sarah. Um, I'm a graduate student here at the Ed School. Um, I'm a former third grade teacher from Browns. Uh, I worked in Brownsville, Brooklyn, where I'll be returning next year as a teach as a school leader. Um, I wrote my question down to make sure that I'm succinct. Um, you all are incredibly articulate and intelligent and powerfully equipped to communicate your message. That being said, you've also alluded to being cognizant of the fact that you do have access to a platform that other students from more marginalized and oppressed American populations do not. 
Um, and a few of you touched upon this briefly earlier, but can you share more about your planned action steps for joining all groups of students together and lifting up all voices, regardless of socioeconomic status or race? That was a beautifully written question. Yeah. Can we just get a real quick? Your students are very lucky. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I'm sure Matt can add more on this because he's been to a lot. Um, we, we've tried, and, as we said earlier, we've gone to a lot of these cities. Obviously, that's not enough, and I don't think there ever will be enough that we can do to ensure that these uh, that these people, at, at least at this point, will, will be covered equally. Because, in plain honesty, they're not. We've seen children get murdered in poor neighborhoods that are not covered the same. And, it, for example, if a child was murdered in a poorer part of Miami, it wouldn't get covered nearly the same as if one child was murdered in Parkland. And that's something that I think we do need to have a, a discussion about, and it's something that we need to face as Americans, that we, we do have this, cl this class and this racial bias that is prevalent in the media and our society. But we, if, so long as we acknowledge that, and so long as we keep speaking about that and acknowledging the fact that we have this platform for in part for a specific reason, because of, because, in part because of our privilege, to be quite honest with you. Parkland is a very affluent um, upper middle class town in Florida, and I think as such we've been, sorry, we've been covered somewhat differently than others would have been. But I think acknowledging that and bringing people from Chicago, bringing people from Liberty City and pointing out and using our platform is one of the best ways for us to be advocating for those individuals. And also pointing out the fact that um, if we're bringing in more, for example, school resource officers into our schools, that poses a major problem because it increases the school to prison pipeline, which disproportionately affects black, Latino men, girls, and boys. Because the fact is, they're, they, black boys, for example, are suspended at a rate three times higher than white boys. That's something that we as a country must face, and it's something that we are going to have to work for the next for decades to overcome. It's racial biasness, and whether or not people are cognizant of it or not, it's still there. And just injustice and inequality anywhere is still everywhere. People are afraid to talk about it. We need to make sure that our politicians do, and we need to inspire student leaders, which we, as you've seen, the, stu the school walkouts. We were thrust into these leadership <laughs> positions, but these students are seeking them out, and that is just something that's very inspiring. So if we hold our politicians accountable, if we say, it's easy to feel guilty that we have this platform and others that face this tragedy every single day don't. But we have to forgive ourselves for that and represent everybody. We have this spotlight and we need to shine it on the people who are too often ignored. And also, uh, just getting more people from those communities involved in politics. They're some of the most underrepresented and marginalized groups in America. As Matt said earlier, many, many politicians probably don't even know that Liberty Square, Liberty City even exists. And that's something that we have to face. And I think one of the best ways of going about that is having people from these communities that are out there and are living through this every day getting involved in politics because if they don't nobody else will this this uh conversation about inclusion and diversity is a really good pat on the back for a lot of people but i mean if you look up on the stage you'll notice that something's missing and uh i mean, thank you <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is that we have to partner with these groups that already exist, whether it's the Dream Defenders and Black Lives Matter and I Care and all these groups around the country that stand up for these disenfranchised voices. Mm -hmm. And so moving forward, moving forward, this has been a learning curve for all of us. We were forced to become professionals on this issue. And like I said earlier, it makes me absolutely sick that we're not sharing the stage right now, but I promise you when you see us on Saturday, we will be. That's yes. a good commitment. <laughs> we're, we're gonna, and needed. We're gonna go to the floor, we're gonna do rapid fire because we're gonna wrap up in just a few minutes. So I'm gonna ask you, I'm just gonna go to you, you, and you. And you'll be our last few questions, but just one sentence, and then we'll answer those questions as a group, if that sounds good, so please. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Graham. I'm a junior here at the college. Thanks so much for being here. My question you alluded to a second ago, it's um, when politicians state a commitment to want to end gun violence in schools, how are we assuring that that's not just going to come in the form of arming teachers or metal detectors or, you know, making classrooms that look more like prisons than, uh, you know, a place of learning and love? Um, how do we hold them accountable just to, to make sure that they're not just spending money to militarize our schools. That's great. And let's get to the second one in this group. Uh, hi, my name is Jack Schroeder. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, first off, thank you. I respect the hell out of what you guys are doing. I just wanted to know, where do you see the movement a year from now? 
Okay, great. And then last question here. Uh, hi, my name is Taya Bauman. I'm a junior at Newton North High School. Um, I just wanted to say that you guys are all have been such huge inspirations to me and taking a leadership role in my high school community. And I wanted to know, um, I had a meeting with my school administrators and um, they're planning on locking my entire, the school building and putting off conversations because they think that the community isn't ready. And I just wanted to know what you guys think that like my high school and all high schools, like what steps we can take to make change. Okay, so I hear comprehensive solutions, what change can happen in high schools and then where is the movement a year from now? And I think that's a great way to close tonight. So um, your yeah. responses. Talking about comprehensive solutions to the issue and making sure that our schools are not becoming prisons. Politicians work for us. Politicians are supposed to work for the people, of the people, by the people. Call your congressmen, call your senators, call your representatives and say, if you do this, you will not be voted in office come November. We will make sure that our schools do not become prisons, our schools do not become jails. Because honestly, that's a life I don't want to live. I don't want to go to school in prison. That sounds like terrible news. I don't want to walk through a metal detector every day. Also, a metal detector, a line of students in front of a metal detector in the morning, a shooter can get a lot of students right there. And this isn't just about schools. You, this, this, these shootings don't just happen in schools. Churches, movie theaters, airports, nightclubs, this is everywhere. That's why the Stop School Violence Act, besides the fact that it doesn't say the word guns, is not close to enough. It's because this isn't just in schools. People aren't safe anywhere. An important thing to remember with communicating this to your representatives is like, instigate a town hall. Confront them directly and be like, hey, we wanted to express our concerns. This is the vast majority of the people who are going to vote for you. Vote our conscience because you are not a trustee, you're a delegate. Take this. And if, and if you call up your representative and they do not accept your invitation to a town hall, then you need to arrange a town hall in your town and say, listen, we wanted our representative here, but he declined the invitation. What does that say to you? And what does that say to you come November? How are you going to make sure that your representatives listen to, your, to their constituents like they're supposed to? And like Cameron was saying, it's not just schools. And that's why we can't just put a bunch of guns in schools. Because are we going to arm our pastors and ministers and our rabbis and DJs in clubs? We can't do that. We can't expect all these leaders, all these people that people go to as sacred holy spaces and spiritual spaces and expect there to be guns there. That's, they're not supposed to be guns in churches. They're not supposed to be guns in hotels and malls and airports and nightclubs and movie theaters. Do you want the usher at the movie theater having a weapon? Let's be real here. And in regards to what you said, one more thing I'd like to add before we move on. Douglas ran out of printer paper for about two weeks this year. So when you tell me there's enough money in the budget to have all of our, t think about the worst teacher you've ever had. Think about it for a second, and then think about them packing heat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what would you say to encourage our, our student one, advocate here? One more comment. Okay, I think this is really important. The one important thing, let me give you a case example of Florida. We, Florida is a very heavily lobbied state by the NRA. We're likely we got some legislation passed, but um, our governor is heavily supported by special interest groups that work on behalf of the privatized prison industry. And what they're, what's going to happen when we get more SROs into our schools is these privatized prisons are going to only increase the school to prison pipeline, and they're going to keep making money off of these people being in prison. Okay, uh, so to answer the student's question about uh, what high schoolers can do and what they can continue to do, I know David has come up with several plans on this, but uh, one thing that we did speak of when we visited Congress, we took the time to go to Maryland high schools. These high schools were some of the ones that organized the lay-in in front of the White House, mm -hmm. where they literally laid down in, in front of the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue, and those kids were just astounding in their own right, and they were surprised at how few of us were in student government. But uh, be, beyond that, just the fact is that there is a the Supreme Court case of Tinker where they said uh, free, free speech and how many amendments and things that in schools, the very fact of the matter is, as long as it doesn't distract from the learning process, as long as it doesn't halt the educational process, and the real halt to education, I mean, our school had to close down because of this shooting. We will never learn the same again, especially this year alone. I mean, the first week we came back, it wasn't high school, it was kindergarten. 
we were petting dogs, we were coloring, we were just Playing gluing video. stuff together. Well, I think there might have awesome. been shaving cream. <laughs> it's, it seems like fun, but then when you realize why you're doing that, why you realize that your AP calculus class is now playing with colored pencils and petting dogs, you realize that that is the real halt to the educational process. The fact that you can be taking a, a math test, the fact that you can be bubbling in a, scan, a scantron sheet, and then thinking about where's the gunman going to come from. And that is a logical thought. That is the thing that we're trying to stop, and that is the thing that high school students everywhere can gather together. They can march. pull their voice. They can march. On march they, they can pre-register to vote. They can register to vote. These are active things. And a lot of people say that if they vote, what will actually come out of it? And yes, some of these things are not instant results. But at the same time, if you're patient, that seed grows into a mighty oak. And that is the thing that we have to fight for. To answer your question about if your school is not supporting you, uh, I'm not the school engagement director, I'm the community engagement director. You can find a place in your community and find people who want to learn and engage them within your own framework. You don't need to rely on your teachers to start a club. You can start a club outside of the school. Use social media, use Facebook pages, use Twitter, and find a way to connect with your peers and educate them on these issues. Have open dialogues. If, you, if all of you leave today and end the conversation as you leave the door, then we failed you and you failed us. We need you to perpetuate this conversation every day because you can't vote every day, but you can educate yourself every day. That's good. So last words. Where can people go to get involved with the march and learn more about this issue and become part of your organization? Marchforourlives.com. Marchforourlivespetition.com as well. And actually that kind of segues into the question you had, where do you see our organization a year from now? First of all, a year from now, I see a very different political conversation and I see a lot of different people in office. I see a lot of people out of office. And I think David can speak better about this than I can. We expect to see thousands of schools with clubs promoting voter education, voter issue. I'm gonna have David explain that. Yeah, I actually just drew this entire plan out on a whiteboard in the back. Um, <laughs> so so it, it's kind of rough right now, um, but I will give you a basic synopsis of what we're trying to do here. What we're gonna have to ensure the civic engagement, engagement of every, all these individuals, especially um, around the country and in places of lower socioeconomic status too, is to engage everybody um, in their schools and if their schools don't allow it, outside of school where they can have a club where every month, for example, we'll, we'll, be mar we'll say, okay, everybody that at your school's club or at your community's club, what you guys should be doing this week is, or this month, is everybody should be planning a march to their state capital to lobby their politicians for them not listening to them. Or you should be doing letter writing campaigns and that's how we ensure that these people remain civically involved because when we become uninvolved, democracy dies and dictatorship begins. A year from now, we expect everybody to be active and that's why what's going on right now is for the first time in a very long time, I'm looking 10 years from now and I'm hopeful. I'm seeing a bright future in which everything isn't falling apart, but everybody's coming together through, as David said, messages of love. As Alex said, remembering, remembering those we've lost and honoring them. It's, it's important that we use any, any chance we get at unity to come together. And that's what's happening now. People are coming together. At the March for Our Lives this Saturday, people are coming together. In their communities, at the school walkouts, people are unifying. And this unity is why our country is the great country it is. There's a very bright future ahead when people from our generation keep on asking questions, we keep on speaking, we keep on leading. And we expect Western politics and the whole conversation evolved to be a much better place than the one we were given. Okay, powerful words. Wait, last word to the last word to Emma. As, we, as our time comes to close. In other words, we see ourselves as a year older a year from now. So I, that's the most I, important I, I really, thing. I really, I'm the one who drew, I want to talk about. A year from now, I just want to say that I hope that we see a lot of better people in office and that we have. I, uh, youth leaders at, a, at the community level leading their own discussions about this issue and inspiring young people all over the country to be more active and we have at the forefront the most educated voting force that this country has ever seen led by people 18 to 25, the people who haven't been as politically active because that is how we're going to see good change in this country. Can you give yourselves a round of applause please? <laughs> Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming to Harvard. We'll see everybody on Saturday at the March. Thank you so much. <laughs>